So yeah, welcome everybody. Delighted to see a, a really good number of, um, of, of people attending today. Um, I'm Peter Mangan, founder and CEO of Freebird Club, a, a startup in the social travel space, specifically for over 50s. We describe ourselves as a social travel club for over 50s, connecting mature explorers for meaningful travel and, and social experiences. I'm joined by my colleague, Rachel Reisman, who's our community manager. Rachel, say hello there. Yes. Hi. Nice to see some familiar faces and to meet the rest of you. Um, very excited to have you on the call. I will be moderating um, the, the chat. So if at any point anyone has any questions, feel free to write them in there. Um, but if you would rather ask out loud um, at the end of each session, we'll pause if there are any uh, questions and you can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, so obviously the, the main act today is Deborah, but I will give you just a very brief introduction to Freebird Club for those who aren't aware of us. Uh, basically, the Freebird Club is a social travel club for the over 50s. Our mission is to enable and empower all our over 50s members to travel, connect, meet and stay with each other as part of a trusted community of peers. We like to say Freebird Club is for people who love travel, but also love helping other people to travel too, by sharing tips and advice, by meeting up with traveling members when they're in your own local area, or indeed possibly hosting them in your home via homestays. None of which is obligatory, but it's uh, it's all very welcome and uh, very enabling for other members, often who are traveling solo. Um, just a little bit of background to why we set up Freebird Club. Society is aging very dramatically. There'll be 2.1 billion people aged over 60 by 2050, which is double today's figure. Everyone talks about the, the aging demographic. Within that, there's an issue with loneliness and isolation. Many older people feel lonely. Uh, we know it's bad for one's health, worse than smoking and obesity. But it also it also um, contributes to the unmet travel needs of many older adults. We, are, we, we now know that travel is the leading aspiration for older adults in retirement, and yet Many people feel they can't go or they can't indulge that, that ambition because they lack companions or possibly the confidence to go alone. And so the vision for Freebird Club is a global community of connected older adults who see the world as their oyster and empower each other to savor it together. So, so Freebird Club, as I say, we describe it as a social travel club for the over 50s. The idea is it's it's capable of putting a travel companion or a companion in the pocket of prospective older Hello. adult travel globally. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, it starts by connecting travelers with locals uh, for tips, advice, and potential meetups. Also homestays, social homestays, where member guests can stay with local hosts and uh, for, for uh, an interactive homestay experience. We're also looking to organize group activities such as local tours and events, but we're also looking to expand the club. We're not there yet, but through partnership plugins, whereby being a member of Freebird Club, you can avail of travel and tourism discounts with other uh, tour travel and tourism book, uh, booking um, uh, connections through our platform. Also ancillary services, we're looking to partner with a travel insurance company and offer those kind of extra benefits. Also enabling members to create uh, subgroups around common interests uh, we consider them as potential sub clubs within Freebird Club, such as a book club or a movie club or whatever people's interests are that they can gather both online and offline in person and ultimately provide a travel oriented social network for people who are interested in travel and cultural exchange. Uh, so how it works, basically, it begins by becoming a Freebird member and then that member when planning a trip i.e., in travel mode can connect with local members for tips, advice, or indeed meetups. They can also stay in the home of a welcoming host for true local hospitality. But as we like to say, every traveler is a local in their own home place, in their own home patch. And so the same free bird in home bird mode can help traveling members enjoy their local area, making new friends in the process, but also with the potential to host them in their home and make some extra money too. Uh, Freebird Club is not just about homestays. Uh, it's much broader than that. And many connections happen online. Uh, as many as possible, we try to encourage to meet offline in person. Uh, but it, there's also obviously this, this opportunity to have homestays. Uh, you can become a homestay host. You can stay in the home of a homestay host. And there are uh, plenty of information. There's plenty of information available on our site as to how you can do that. 
but it's something we love to encourage because it's probably the best connection of the lot when you stay with the local and you get to really experience the uh, the travel experience, the local area through the eyes of a local. Uh, Freebird Club is global already. It's uh, it's in the early days of our growth, but we're already seeing uh, members in 35 countries globally and uh, the seats are sown for uh, a worldwide network of, of connected Freebirds. Every free bird on the platform has a, every member has a detailed uh, profile which describe where they describe themselves, their interests, languages they speak, etc. This is just a snapshot of of somebody's uh, profile there in New York. Uh, there's quite a lot of very interesting uh, things written there about uh, Madeline. Um, and the idea here is quite simply, if you're interested in visiting New York, you can connect with Madeline in advance for local advice or tips, or you can potentially meet arrange to meet up when and if if and when you get there. Uh, so here also is a, 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 just an example of the homestay host, Maria in Portugal. She describes her place and photos there, very familiar stuff, and how you can actually book a stay with, uh, with uh, Maria. Uh, and of course, you can find out, as I say, every single member, whether they're a, they're a prospective traveler or, or guest or local or, or indeed homestay host, has a rich profile so you can get to know the person that you'd be staying with. Um, through the platform all in advance. Uh, we're also organizing some events with some uh, travel uh, partners internationally. At the moment, we, we're focusing on three key cities, London, Dublin, and Lisbon, and we're working with local partners on the ground there, whereby we're having co-branded uh, local events, walking tours, cultural events that you can sign up to uh, through Freebird Club. And these are all accessible and on display via our Facebook uh, page as well. Uh, these are just a selection of some of the partners we're currently working with. Obviously, this is the, the thin end of the wedge. We're looking to create a, a network of partners where we can have these kind of events spread out internationally. Um, we certainly would like to see more, in, particularly in the US, where we have quite a few members already. We're a small team so far, uh, but a very a very driven and passionate team. Uh, you've met Rachel already. I'm joined by uh, seven other people also uh, across. I'm in Ireland, by the way. Uh, most of the team is in the UK. Rachel is in the, in the UK, but we have Rachel and Brooke who are, who are American, and we have a couple of developers in Portugal as well. So we're very international as a team. Uh, and just finally, just to say we're backed by Nesta and Founders Factory, who have um, become our key stakeholders and investors. We've also won some uh, a grant in, in healthy aging from Innovate UK, and we've won some major awards for social innovation and uh, startup uh, endeavor as well. So uh, it's uh, we'd like to think of it. We, we have a good platform to grow and uh, bring the free bird club vision to the world. So. Uh, this is a great place to start and, and we love to connect with people uh, and then uh, along our, our journey so far we've connected with Deborah Ives who I'm delighted to be able to uh, speak with today and uh, without further ado, oh, sorry just before we leave this, if anyone has any questions on Freebird Club our website is freebirdclub.com there's you can email us there but we'll be sending out information anyway after the uh, after the session so anybody can connect and link through to us if they wish. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our main uh, <laughs> act today, which is basically Deborah, uh, Deborah Ives. So just by way of introduction, thank you, Deborah, for for um, thank you for inviting to, uh, me here to be uh, our guest today and to tell us about your own experiences. So. As a brief introduction, uh, we're very excited to be welcoming today's speaker, Deborah Ives, who is the founder of Solo and Style. Deborah lives and breathes travel and is the voice of and a beacon for women over 50 who love to travel independently. After experiencing the unexpected, as many of us do in life, which Deborah will uh, delve into a little bit herself, she came to discover the joys of solo travel and has since built out one of the most inspirational and vibrant online community groups for like minded women. Deborah, who, uh, who was recently, in fact, on the cover of The Guardian for her experience as a solo female traveler started Solo in Style several years ago to blog about her adventures and share her personal experiences and tips with the, with the hope of inspiring and encouraging others to embark on their own solo travel adventures. Today, her Facebook community Solo in Style has over half a million over 50s female travelers engaged, which is a true testament to the path that she has helped pave for solo female travelers. Alongside a successful 30-year career in marketing, fine wine, and culinary arts, 
Deborah, now age 64, I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning, continues to expand solo in style globally to support and encourage as many women as possible to fulfill their solo travel ambitions. She is a knowledgeable, humorous and entertaining speaker, so we would like to give her a very warm welcome to the Freebird community. So welcome, Deborah, and thank you so much for speaking with us today. Wow, thank you very much. What an introduction. I hope I can live up to that. <laughs> thank I would you just very like much. To say, not at all. Uh, and I would just like to say uh, to the audience, please feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat, if you know how to use that, uh, or indeed put up your hand. And uh, Rachel will be monitoring uh, all of these questions and we'll address them throughout our, our Q&A session. We don't want it to be too formal. It's quite a fluid conversation. And so any questions that you may have along the way, feel free to, to let us know. So, uh, Deborah, let's kick off. Uh, the first question I want to ask you is, can you tell us a bit about how you started solo traveling yourself and what motivated you to start solo and style subsequently? So um, I think you sort of touched on that unexpected life experience, which was um, a divorce, a very unexpected divorce. Um, and um, I had been married for quite some time and always loved to travel and had been sort of in, in my marriage, had been the person who did the, really enjoyed doing all of the organization and all the planning of it all. And so um, we had tickets for a, a trip of a lifetime to Malaysia which was going to go to, we were going to Borneo to see the orangutans and um, end up on a diving island because um, I'm a keen diver and my ex is a keen diver as well. So that was all, the deposit was paid and then things happened and I suddenly found myself on my own and I thought, well, sod this, I am not going to lose the deposit um, being a bit of a sort of a, a, a canny northerner. So I decided I'm just going to do this on my own. So um, so I, I did decide to go on my own and it was absolutely petrifying to start with. I remember sitting at Heathrow Airport and just thinking, what on earth have you done? And, and sort of sending a text to my sister saying, you know, I hope I see you again. And off I went. Um, and I had an absolute trip of a lifetime. It was just amazing. And um, I mean, there were moments that were really scary, very nerve wracking. Um, looking back now, I think, gosh, I must have just looked, must have stood out a bit like a bit of sore thumb because I I felt as though every, all eyes were on me because I was on my own, which is ridiculous. But anyway, I had a fantastic time. And then that really hooked me. And, um, and so um, I kind of came back to the UK and I thought, well, there must be other ladies in this situation who are trying to kind of, find their feet traveling a little bit sort of later in life on their own. Um, so I started this um, Facebook group, Solo in Style, thinking um, I could sort of exchange ideas. And because there really wasn't anywhere else, or I couldn't find anywhere else to kind of connect. And for a long time, there were about, I don't know, 200 people, 300 people, as my sister and a few friends. And, and, it, and it took a long time to get going. And then the last sort of six years, certainly since post COVID, but even during during the pandemic, the numbers have just gone through the roof. And um, and th these ladies come on, and it's everything from you know people who are you wanting to turn to travel to help get over bereavement or illness or life life events, through to women who've been traveling on their own forever and are motorcycling across China. Um, just a whole range of um, women and our common thread is that we love to travel solo. And my sort of definition of solo is you don't know anybody when you land where you're going. So some of them choose to join groups. Some of them choose to you know, connect through various platforms like Freebird and, and meet people there. And some really are very independent and just want to sort of disappear off into the sunset. But um, I honestly don't think there is a question that has not been answered and um, a place in the world where somebody will put in, you know, this, oh, I know I'm in some incredibly remote corner of the world, please help. And there'll have been 500 women will have been there last year. Another hundred have got it on their bucket list. Ten are there at the moment. It's just, it's just amazing. So, um, so that's kind of how it all came about. That's, hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And it really is about, you know, sometimes being forced out of your comfort zone. But it's 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 outside the comfort zone where where adventure and and, and you know real exploration begins. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The, the, from what I've seen of solo and style, obviously, I'm probably not I'm not able to be part of the group uh, as a male, but um, my colleagues have been having uh, shown me it's a very vibrant group and the, the amount of exchange of information that just that organic yeah. people helping each other. Uh, right. It's it's just really inspiring and, and enabling of people who might be nervous about taking that first step. But uh, yeah. there really is power in, in the group to uh, to to tap into. Um, Given the free bird club is a, is a is a I suppose it's somewhat aligned in terms of trying to enable and empower people to right. take those those steps into and and travel uh, and fulfil ambitions, um, but it's open to men and women. And I would just wonder, from your perspective, what are some key differences between solo travel experiences for women versus men, um, as well as possibly for older versus younger travellers? Are you seeing kind of different types of experiences and issues arise? Um, that, that's a really good question. I think that safety, of course, is the big thing. And, and I think perhaps as a woman and even as an older woman, you might feel a little bit um, uh, a little bit more vulnerable as you're kind of stepping out on your own, especially if you haven't traveled um, much at all. Um, so there are con this constant theme of, you know, safety, safety when I travel, safety in, her, you know, when I'm in my accommodation. Uh, how do I safely connect with somebody? Uh, I mean, I only ho host a Facebook group with, with the best will in the world. There can be anybody posing with a with with us with a profile. So that's why I think it's so important to kind of you know, if you want to connect, if that's one of the things you really want to do, to do it through someone like yourselves, where you know you know at least that you're connecting with people who have kind of been vetted and have have joined. Um, joined your platform but certainly for women safety is, is a big thing definitely um and um and i think the age thing i mean i don't know now i am um because i've been i've been planning a big trip for this summer and and i'm suddenly even now having traveled a lot feeling starting to question myself a little bit more and and double checking the details and thinking oh you know what's making me feel a bit uncomfortable here and it's i know it's just an age thing it's just uh I'm just not, um, you know, perhaps as, um, I don't know what the word is, carefree. I don't know. Maybe that's not the right word. But and then also there's the physical side of things. Sometimes you want to go at a slower pace. Sometimes, you know, with the best will in the world, you really don't want to be, you know, full on the whole time. You just want to take your time and slow travel or, you know, travel in, in whatever way. So I think those are some really big differences um both around sort of age and also around female travel i'm not sure yeah. if anybody on the on the call has any thoughts on that uh, i get i get the sense that we've got quite a few ladies on here who are traveling already on their own or traveling certainly any questions so far actually on that um I, I just uh, to that point we have noticed a significant growth and actually i, I should say about freebird club uh, i think it's 75 percent of the members are women so right. clearly the uh, the demand or the interest in in traveling in, in yeah. later life we'll call it uh seems to have really you know uh, grabbed the attention of, of women for for more than men certainly that's what we're seeing yeah i mean that, yeah, that's what the article, the Guardian article focused on yeah. exactly that, the fact that it was women and a lot of women in my group come in and say, does anybody know about groups like this for men? Because my husband's interested in finding one for guys. Because, I mean, it, just because you're traveling solo, it doesn't mean you're necessarily single. I mean, there's lots of people who travel on their own for lots of reasons, um, not not necessarily because they are they're sing they're single. So, um, yeah, it's it's very much a female thing, isn't it? And, and so on that, we've noticed a significant growth in female solo travel in recent years, and, and The Guardian was speaking exactly to that, The Guardian article. What factors do you think have particularly contributed to this trend? Uh, and do you foresee it evolving further in the future? I think it I think it will evolve. And I think without, you know, I think finally the travel industry is waking up a little bit to the fact that we are a powerful um, demographic and um and we want to spend our money it's not always about money people travel on a budget as well as traveling with money but we want to get out there and we want to we want to do this and so um so i think for on the one hand the travel industry in general is waking up so now i mean there's article there are lots of articles about the solo female traveler whereas maybe 10 years ago it was really hard to find anybody 
who was kind of cur curating things specially for that demographic. Now I think you know lots of companies are waking up to to that as a as a, as a big target audience. Um, so I think it will definitely evolve and. Um, it's great that things like homestays with Freebird help avoid things like the single supplement because that's sometimes, you know, there are financial barriers that's, that make it more expensive to travel on your own. And um, and so, you know, this is a great way of overcoming that. Um, and, and you can travel, you know, within whatever budget that you want. And I think it's just a case of, I don't know, generally now, perhaps we are as women are feeling a little bit more uh, confident as we get older and a bit more visible as we get older and hey you know what's to stop us nothing let's just get out there and do it and one of the overwhelming um messages i think that comes through comes through from my group is that it'll somebody will say you know oh you know thank you for your help i had to add questions about i don't know spain or whatever i finally got off the fence and i finally did it and and the bottom is always you know if you're on the fence don't hesitate just do it just go you won't regret it and i think once you get bitten by the bug it's a little bit sort of it's quite addictive and you just you want to do it again so that's probably why it's going so quickly and given, I suppose, that there are some reservations and, and you talked about the uh, safety being concerned for sure. Um, are there any other kind of common priorities or concerns that you've observed among women in solo travel? Anything that in particular that uh, you, you've seen arise? Eating alone, that's a big one. That comes up a lot. Um, there seems to be a lot of... Um of sort of 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 uh, conversations around eating alone and uh, how to do that and how you know well i mean there are lots of kind of angles to this one angle is there are lots of restaurants around the world where where they don't really accept solo female travelers of any age and they feel uncomfortable having somebody a woman sat on their own in their restaurant or bar um and I have experienced that myself in the UK as well as as elsewhere. But um, and there, but then right through to the you know, gosh, I feel really uncomfortable. What am I going to do for you know a couple of hours sat there on my own? Through to the practicalities of what do I do if I have to leave my stuff and go to the loo, and you know, how does that just practical things? Through to you know, gosh, I'm here on my own and I'm looking around and this restaurant's full of couples and no one's talking to each other, which always makes me smile because I mean I think that's quite quite often something that when you're observing you can see other people behave. So eating alone is a big one, um, and there are lots of ways of which you, you can kind of make that more comfortable. Yeah, yeah I think I, I think whether you're male or female, that idea of being in a bar on your own or yeah, well, certainly yeah. sitting down in a restaurant, yeah. you have to get over that self conscious uh, yeah. aspect to it. But hunger right. is a great <laughs> is a great way to uh, yeah. overpower. That. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but it, have you any advice on that? Actually, how to make it easier for people in terms of maybe the timings or the kind of restaurant you choose? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, I'm a bit. I'm a real foodie, so I actually like. I follow lots of food people on television. So I go where I go quite often and I'll retrace their steps and go to places. So I could, I've been to all kinds of places from sort of more formal places to, I, I love kind of hole in the wall, like street food as I, I love all of it. So, so, I mean, I think there are challenges in different bits. I'm depending on where I am, if I'm at lunch, I will often just go for a lovely long late lunch and um, and that then sort of bridges the gap. And then in the evening, you can, if you're in a hotel or Airbnb, you might just want to sit on your balcony with a, with a, a nightcap or whatever you and you've already eaten. And so it's more comfortable somehow during the day. Um, I love it if you find yourself in a place that's got a, where you can eat at the counter or, or at the, the bar and you can get chatting. And I also think if you get friendly waiting staff, it's brilliant because when they know you're on your own, if they're positive and, and chatty, they'll quite often, and this happens all, a lot, kind of slip you little, oh, have you have a try of this. This is our news, you know, starter or here, let me top up your glass, don't tell anybody. And blah. and so they look after you, which is really nice too. Um, so those are some good ways. And of course, you know, there's the book and the phone and all of that, but sometimes I think it's just nice to own it and and embrace it and um yeah. yeah go for it absolutely and i suppose that's the thing you know solo traveling i uh, as somebody who has done a lot of solo travel 
um, over the years and I really enjoyed the experience but you don't really want to be alone all the time you do right. want to have these connections with right. people along the way whether they're the waiter or just people you meet you know um, either by joining a tour yeah. or, or yeah, yeah. people wherever you're staying and obviously a homestay is a, a great example or a great opportunity to do yeah. that but it's finding these touch points that you're not actually feeling alone all the time that uh, and yet being comfortable in your own skin you yeah. know when you are in a situation like in a restaurant but uh, yeah. um, yeah. as someone who has experienced uh, unexpected situations during your travels things happen um often uh, that we don't expect could you share any tips or advice for handling challenges that may arise while you're traveling while you're on the trip uh, if anything yeah. goes wrong or you feel uncomfortable or yeah i mean i there i have had situations where i have felt uncomfortable and um but i mean I, i've had and i've also had some real disasters i remember going all the way to the philippines to go um sorry to was it the philippines or indonesia I can't remember to go diving indonesia and i landed and then and then instantly was transported by boat miles to an island hours away and when i got there they said can we see your passport and i and i couldn't find it and i dropped it up in the airport because I knew I'd had it because I'd come through passport control and um some very kind person at the hotel called the airport and they had it had been handed in and they couriered my passport to me thank god because I was I had endless nights lady bed thinking how on earth am I going to get my passport so I think I think you you know never be afraid to ask for help never be afraid to um to kind of um sort of throw yourself on the kindness of strangers and people will always help you if they can I mean I know if I'm in a situation in London and I see somebody and they're asking for help I would always help you would you just would um and so I think um you know and, and other situations if you're lost and you know you can ask and ask for help and never ever worry or feel uncomfortable doing that um but yeah I mean I have not touch wood had um you know medical emergencies whilst I've been traveling but I mean of course all these things happen and I think you just have to you know be a little bit prepared for these things and make sure you're staying in touch with you know whoever you want to stay in touch with at home and they know where you are and and kind of a bit of a safety net yeah and absolutely and and, and just to to maybe extrapolate a bit on that are there things that you should do in the planning stages or or just kind of sensible guidelines as to ensuring your safety and security and and general welfare while you're traveling are there uh, you any particular tips or advice that people could follow on that well i uh, and i don't know whether this is a british thing uh because i we have a lot of um north americans in the group and i think it's now changing but i never ever travel without travel insurance ever i never have and um and i can i i have I've, i have i had to call on it maybe once i had a flight cancelled but i would never travel without it and that I've seen lots of incidents of ladies who have had accidents and ended up in hospital, for example, where they have been really grateful that they have had their medical expenses covered. So I would definitely always um, have travel insurance. And I know that there are websites. I don't know whether we do this in the UK, but certainly in the US, you can register as a traveler if you're going to a foreign country so that different departments know where you are as a tourist. Um, but just also, um, I always, you know, keep in touch with my sister and my brother and it just sort of, I do put things on my private Facebook so friends can see that, you know, everything's going well. And um, so it, it's just sort of checking in, I think. I'm just trying to think of the other things, the usual things, never travel with jewellery or anything. I think my motto is if you are worried about losing it, then don't take it with you. With, you know, obviously your passport, you have to, but within reason. I don't I don't travel with jewellery or, uh, you know, and I do have a crossbody bag that I just keep by my side and kind of take normal precautions that, you know, you probably would, I would anyway, at least walking around London. Yeah. No, absolutely. And... Uh... Oh, actually, I'm just. I, do we see a yeah, question there? I, yes, uh, we have two yeah. questions. We can um, start with Jones, just because it is talk, uh, talking about what you just touched on. Yeah, I think it's State Department exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Good then question. going back to safety, uh, Angela had asked earlier when we were discussing Freebird and homestays, um, how our members are vetted um, to make sure that staying with them is as safe as possible. 
Yeah, so that that's the registration process, and that's basically, Freebird Club is a is a paid model. Although at the moment you can pay whatever you feel is appropriate, anything from one euro, one dollar, one euro to up up to a hundred. And uh, the reality is, with that, really, it's by by ensuring that um, only people who have come through the paywall are members of the, of Freebird Club. There's a certain check that goes with that. But the main thing is verifying identity. So every Freebird Club member who comes and joins the club. Uh, sub has to submit a, a copy of their uh, of their ID uh, that's checked by the team, and also there's a number of contact points as well that are all verified and and checked. So it's 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 not so much vetting in the in the kind of official sense. It's more verifying the identity of people, making sure we have um, the, the full details on them, uh, and none of which is maintained. We don't we don't store that information. We don't store copies of passports or driver license or anything like that but it's a check at the point of joining uh, and also if there were any of our hosts they also would provide um evidence of utility bill or something that verifies the address as well so we just have a few checks there that make sure that uh, we can stand over that everybody is who they say they are and they're, they're living where they say they are as well in the case of hosts um okay uh, is there anything else another I think yes. I think Alice is just confirming it is the State Department that you had registered with, and also to know the where the U.S. Embassy is in the country that you're visiting. If that's if that's also important for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So moving on from the cautionary stuff about safety, etc. Um, what are some of the most memorable experiences or encounters that you've had while traveling solo? Oh gosh. I mean, <clears throat> you know, um, where. I mean, there are places that I have been to that I have particularly enjoyed. I absolutely love <clears throat> Sri Lanka. For me, it was a highlight, so much so that I went back a second time in the same year. I just loved everything about it. Um, you know, the, the actual, the, the physical beauty of it, the people, the food was amazing, the culture, all of it. I loved it. Felt very safe. Had a great time. And India, I love India. Um, I, and I've had some fantastic, I, had, I think one of the nicest things that I find um, and it kind of is, you know, it works both ways. I'm, I kind of touched on it before about when you're on your own, you can end up in situations where where people will sort of take you a little bit under their wing. And then for you get really, you can get really special treatment. Okay. You know, or, um, All right. And um, th there have been situations where um, I have been sort of the only guest somewhere and you end up, you know, having the most memorable evening where someone's like, come on, let's go. And they take you to a bar or a, just really kind of help, help you kind of become, well, very much on the free bird lines, more of a, a local and, and you get, you feel like you're getting really kind of special treatment. Um, so, I mean, again, my first, that first trip I mentioned to Borneo, I remember I was the only guest in this huge um I suppose a wildlife resort. And I remember the first, I remember walking into it and it was all cabins and I, and I went to the reception and, and I as I was checking in and I said oh and how are you full tonight how many people are here and she said you're the only guest and I just went into this decline and I went to my room and I just wept on my bed because thinking, oh my god I'm gonna die in my bed I'm gonna be bitten by a snake no one would knows where I am that's it this is the end of me and I ended up having the absolute best time because I was the only one on the on so I had special game drives and safari and I got to know the the guy who was leading it and he would like knock on my door and say hey I'm just going to go and see this do you want to come and had a fabulous time so um so there are lots of pluses about being on your own well the other big thing I think is meeting other people too I mean I've met some fantastic people along the way some that are literally just sort of friends for that moment and then some that you stay in touch with and maybe meet up with again along the way. Or um, So, you know, that's been a huge, huge uh, highlight of a lot of my travels, um, just the people that you meet and the encounters that you have. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I guess the, you know, the, the Internet has uh, and, and platforms are like Freebird Club or or indeed Solo and Style, but other platforms that enable people to make these connections perhaps in advance or, or while they're there. Yeah. Do you think they're significant in terms of uh, enabling or improving the experience for solo travellers, um, helping them to meet other people while they're out on the road? Oh, I think so, definitely. Made a difference? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, some people will always just want to go off on their own and do their own thing. And, and um, I mean, of course, that's absolutely fine. And I think, you know, I'm sort of, I like to dip in and out. I love the idea of being on my own, but I also love the idea of being able to kind of meet up, you know, along the way and know that there's somebody somewhere and we can get together for a meal. Um, and then there are others who who really want to join a group experience of other solos and travel, you know, with, with, where everything is taken care of for them. So I think there's a huge part. I mean, for the Free, Freebird Club, I think is is great because it does offer that chance to connect, but to be you know, assured that you are connecting with the person that you think you are, as opposed to the sort of the more anonymous ways of doing it through Facebook and other social media. But um, yeah, I mean, I think connecting is a, is a, a hugely important part of any travel, solo or otherwise. But I do think, um, I do think I've met more people traveling on my own than I would have had if I had continued to kind of be traveling as a married couple. That's probably just that no, there's no evidence of that, just my my opinion and my feeling, but yeah, I feel as though I have. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. Whether it's traveling with friends or traveling with a partner, um, you, any any trip I've taken on my own, I've been, I just, it brings out the extrovert in you because you're going to have to yeah, make an yeah, effort. Yeah. Otherwise you'll, you'll be just on your own all the time and you won't be having any conversation, you won't get any immersion into the, the local scene. Yeah. Um, and it brings that out, whether you like it or not, you're kind of, you know, that that need for for to talk, need to connect at some level with people. Yeah. Uh, I think it it, it it comes to life when you're traveling on your own. Um, you, you you kind of have to overcome the shyness if you have shyness, if that's part of your, your character. Um, is there a difference between traveling? I know you've, you've traveled far and wide into pretty exotic locations. Is there a difference between traveling solo as a female in in the developed world, we'll say, Europe, the States, wherever, versus, you know, maybe the developing world? I think there I mean, is, yeah, yeah. I mean, one big, big thing is language. Um, and we tend to, I mean, <clears throat> I do speak a little bit of French, a little bit of German, but I don't speak a word of Spanish. And I had, I didn't feel massively comfortable in Argentina, for example, because, um, I honestly could not really get into it because I couldn't speak a word of Spanish and, and I found, and rightly so, why do we make, we think everyone's going to speak English, but, um, so I think language is one thing. I think, um, one, you know, things, places where I might feel a little bit more, um, challenged, I will, I will organize, you know, and, and, and some people find this a little bit, a bit uncomfortable, but it's, very normal. For example, in India and in Sri Lanka, you hire, I hired a private driver. And that's actually the only way that you can get around anyway, because there is no other way, uh, really, perhaps in India, you could do the train, but certainly in Sri Lanka, you couldn't really. And for a lot of British people, that feels a little bit weird, because you'd never really hire a driver to take you anywhere, you know, you might get an Uber, but and a taxi for a short percent. But in these, but, but in India, for example, I've been a few times to India, very normal and that gives you this feeling of safety because they just really look after you and they will take you to wherever you need to go if they're a guide as well they'll show you around but more often than not they'll just put you know deliver you to your hotel and pick you up when you need to go and that makes you feel a lot more comfortable also if I'm flying somewhere um long haul I mean and, and I always try to make sure that I've got somebody to meet me at the airport. I'll arrange that either through wherever I'm staying or through websites or what have you. Because for me, I love that it makes me feel much more comfortable when I come out of the airport and somebody's got my name on a sign. And after that, once I've got to the wherever I'm staying, I'm fine. But I just like to have that first steps into a into a foreign country, especially if it's countries that are a little bit more challenging you know to navigate on your own um just make sure that you know you're not you've got somebody to meet you is um always makes me feel a lot better a lot more comfortable yeah absolutely but and those kind of things you know organizing a driver they're so much more affordable in these countries where they are you know yeah, yeah. where you yeah. might need them to, for, for safety security reasons and for getting around you know they right the thought right. of getting a private driver here in ireland or in the uk would be i know you have somebody um, drive me from London to Glasgow. I mean, yeah, exactly. ever think about that, do you? I know, I know. Yeah, 
So yeah. certainly the, the the budget side of things and and some right. of these more locations makes uh, makes it a lot easier to make that yeah. decision. Um, in terms of accommodation uh, choices, Deborah, do you what what's your own preference? Where where do you find? Do you stay in a variety of places? I, mean, I do. The, obviously, the hotel, Airbnb, or homestays. What, what do you tend to go for yourself? Any advice on, on that? Yeah, all of the above. And I think it depends really on where you're going and, and back to sort of how comfortable you are um, in the countries or the locations that you're going to. If I know somewhere really well and I feel really comfortable, I would probably get an Airbnb because I know that I can go shopping and I can kind of look after myself. Um, and if it was... Um, I'm not a fan of big hotels and resorts. Um, if I'm staying in a hotel, I tend to look for smaller, more boutique type hotels. That way, again, people tend to sort of know you're there and will chat to you and you can tend to, you know, you can get a bit more of a rapport going over. And I've met some fabulous people like over breakfast in various small hotels around the world. Um, and just I found that really interesting I have done homestays again it depends exactly where where you're going and I have done the occasional resort it's just not really my thing um it depends on where you're going to I like to try local the local food if it's possible it's not always possible um so sometimes if you're in a resort you know there's you don't ever leave the kind of compound you just can you can kind of fly in and out of a country and I've never really a seen anything particularly or be supported the local economy too because i think as you know we're we're traveling and we're we are um guests in different countries and i always think it's important for us to try to support those the local economy when we're there and to support the local local businesses and the local people the you know people who local homestays local hotels etc sure yeah and and uh it was ethical traveling as well trying to leave a positive footprint in in, right. in everything so economically and and environmentally in your host destination yeah um good what are your thoughts on homestays in particular for solo female travelers do you think they make a particular sense is it uh is it something you'd recommend oh god yeah definitely i think it makes um great sense i mean i, I think it makes sense from both angles. So I could be, I actually don't have it anywhere in my very small um, London flat to rent out as a homestay because otherwise I would. I think it's great as a as a female to in, invite other um, solo female travellers to come and, and stay with you. It's a great way to meet connections and, and to show people around your, your city or your town. So, and also to, you know, to be able to get a little bit of income, I think it's fantastic uh, from that angle, but also from, you know, the traveling perspective. I think it's a great way to, to you know, to know that you're going somewhere uh, and to know that there's somebody there who is expecting you and you, you know, you can kind of bond with if you want to be on your own. I'm sure you can, but you know that you've got that safety net. I think it's a really great way to for, uh, for solo female travelers to, to to really feel safe when they when they explore definitely okay um just before we maybe throw it open to to the to the audience for some more questions um finally for women who may be hesitant as we as we know there is there's a, a growing interest in solo travel among women over 50 particularly but uh for women who may be thinking about it getting close to taking the big step, but but are hesitant or nervous about embarking on their first solo trip, what encouragement or guidance would you offer to help them take that leap and embrace this uh, this new adventure? I mean, it's really kind of flippant to say, oh, do it, you'll never regret it, you won't look back. But I do honestly think that is a very, that is a very true statement. I honestly, certainly from my group, um, which is, is big, so there's a lot, there are lots of comments. There are very, 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 very few who have said, and there are some who've said, I did it and it wasn't for me, so I won't be doing it again. So, the, but the majority are, like, oh my goodness, I wish I had had the confidence to do this sooner. So I think, you know, I think that it, you know, you, you really won't be disappointed, but I think take baby steps, first of all, you don't have to fly across the world in your first go, I mean, go somewhere local. If you're uncomfortable eating out, then take yourself out for lunch in your local town or city. Um, just, you know, do 
explore locally and just get a level of of comfort doing what you're doing and then a great way to then if you want to explore further is to um in the first instance you might want to add on uh, a stay with friends or a stay with family or a, a group trip and then add on some solo days of your own and that happens a lot um whereby you you can have the comfort of a group to start with and then you know that you've got four or five days afterwards Homestays are absolutely brilliant, as we've already said, because you know you've got someone there. Just um, if you, if you again, if that physical travel is uncomfortable, then look at some local homestays and just do some things sort of in your own country before you be kind of venture abroad. So I think um, lots of lots of ways you can ease yourself into it if you don't, you know, if, if you're really kind of looking for ways to feel more comfortable. Absolutely. I think uh, very inspiring um, words to, to finish on there. It, it really is about taking the leap, I think. And, um, they, you know, there's no time like the present and, and, and age oh, isn't a barrier. Absolutely. There, may be, there may be additional concerns sometimes and, you know, um, but the reality is it's just a case of, you know, doing the right things, being sensible about it and uh, and embracing exactly. the, the yeah. opportunity. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Will we hear from some of the audience? Is anyone here an active solo female traveler who wants to give their own a little bit of advice or information based on their own experiences? Are any questions for Deborah while we have her? Everyone's on mute. The one lady's typing something. I can. She looks like she is, but I'm not sure. I can't see her name. I would say age is not a barrier either. You mentioned age. I mean, certainly in my group, there are ladies in their mid to late eighties who are traveling on their own, some for the first time. Um, so age is not a barrier. It's, it really is. And, you know, depending again on your um, mobility, I mean, it doesn't matter. There are always ways that you can do explore if you want to. And there are so many different ways that you can <clears throat> do it um, to make, to, to feel comfortable. Oh, here's a question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so Joan wrote in the chat, when wandering around a new city, is it best to have your passport on your person or to leave it in your room? Oh, this is a debated heat, heatedly in the group. Um, so, for example, in Italy, you have to have your passport on you. You will be fined um, if you are stopped by the police and you don't have your passport. And there are other countries, too. Uh, I only know about Italy because I was looking at it recently. Um, because I'm going there and you are uh, uh, legally obliged to carry your passport. And a copy is not enough. You have to have your actual passport there with you. I personally leave mine in my room, um, but it's a tough one, isn't it? If there's a safe, of course, it's great. Some in the in the in the sort of olden days, you would leave it behind the reception with the receptionist. I'm not sure I would do that anymore now, though. But that was really common when you were traveling because you you know you felt it was safe to leave your passport there. And I think looking back on it, sometimes they were literally just in like pigeonholes. Yeah, kept make always make a copy, always, always. I take make a copy of everything. Because the other thing too, as we have so much on our phone, my other thing is like, oh my goodness, what happens if I don't have Wi-Fi? You know, if I can't get my tickets and I can't get, so I do, I am a paper, you know, I like to kind of have paper copies. So I'll have a, all my insurance certificates, of course. And, but also my, uh, all my flight details, my booking references, I have paper copies of all of that and the addresses of where I'm going. Um, yeah, and someone else is coming in now, Charlotte, in the US, a picture with your phone, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it is, absolutely, I would agree. I think I wouldn't normally take my passport with me all the time. I just know that in Italy, it's you have to, and I'm sure there are other countries where you have to do it too, but I would normally leave it in the room. Okay. Um, you mentioned Italy there, probably my favorite country to visit, right. so, you know, pound for pound, as they say. Um, are there any, if you were to, if I was to challenge you with like your your top three or your, or three high recommendations for countries to visit as a solo female traveler, any yeah. any particular gems come to mind? Oh, so hard, honestly. I mean, it got, first of all, there are so many places I haven't been to. Um, 
And in fact, I don't really know Italy very well. I used to live in the south of France. So I was right next door to Italy. And I really, I was there for 15 years and I did go to Italy, but not really um, an awful lot. So I'm going to be discovering Italy a little bit more this year, actually. Oh. Sri Lanka, I mentioned before, I cannot speak more highly about Sri Lanka. I loved it. Um, where else have I really enjoyed? I, I, I honestly can't find... Um, think of places that I didn't really enjoy. Some have been a little bit more challenging. I love, I'm, I'm now discovering Spain again, right on our um, on our doorstep really from, from the UK, um, more Southern Spain. So I'm a big fan now of, of Malaga and places down there. I love Mallorca. Um, so, <clears throat> so um, but honestly, I mean, it's a, that's so tough. That is such a tough, uh, question. I, I honestly, as I say, I'm trying to think of anywhere that I really didn't like. I didn't really get along in Argentina, but that was more on me because I couldn't speak the language and felt uncomfortable. But some good questions coming. Anywhere would you just where you would discourage travel? Not really. Um, I mean, perhaps controversial. I don't like Morocco. My goodness, Morocco is probably one of the number one destinations from the women in my group seems like so many people love Morocco. I wasn't a fan of Morocco. I got violently ill and and just oh, I just didn't it just didn't do it for me at all. So if you asked me personally, I would say mm, probably not Morocco, but lots of people love Morocco. And another lady's going to Ireland. Oh this one could be this one could be for yeah. you for you Peter. Using yeah, train no, buses. Um, Trains and buses, yeah, absolutely. Should. Is there anything I should be concerned about? No, I wouldn't say there's anything to be concerned about. The only thing is rural Ireland is not the best served by public transport. Uh, where I am at the moment, down in, in Kerry, southwest of Ireland. Um, the, yeah, the bus transport's not great. Um, but <laughs> but certainly everything is it's safe and uh, it's not not too expensive to get around. Um, with a bit of planning in advance, yeah, you, you'll get to everywhere you need to, you need to go. And there are a lot of... Um, Say for example, there you know the more scenic areas around the Atlantic coast, uh, the Ring of Kerry, as I say, where I am. Um, there, there are many you know smaller buses, chartered buses, or bus tours that that do the the scenic touristic areas. So uh, you'll have no problem really with with that. Um, but uh, I, and actually, Rachel was in Ireland for was in Dublin recently for St Patrick's Day. I think she had a good. Experience. Oh wow, that must have been great. Yes, it was great. I loved it. I would definitely go back. But just touching on the transportation. Uh, a few friends of mine, I don't know where you're located, Joan, but um, we drive on the other side of the road in America. Um, they do in the UK and in Ireland. And my friends rented a car and drove uh, around the, the coast. Carolina. I personally would never drive. I'm from New York. I would never drive in New York to begin with, uh, or at least in New York City. Uh, but they rented a car and they were able to drive and they had no problems. Um, but... I don't think I would do that. I wouldn't, I would, I'm not advising that you do that. Um, but if you wanted to. There you go. Look at that. Somebody's done that very thing. Somebody local took care of the transportation. Yeah. I think it always helps if you have a car with that's got the steering wheel on the correct side of the road for where you're driving. The worst thing I find as a Brit is if you cross the channel and you're in your English car and your steering wheel's on the wrong side. So you're driving literally in the gutter. That is really quite tricky but if you rent a car and the steering wheel at least is on the right side of for where you're driving that's an advantage but yeah yeah maybe that's also an interesting too i don't care to drive too much when i travel now um we've time for another couple of questions before we we, we wrap up quick one from me actually deborah um do, do you use guides um are you somebody who, who uses the old trusted guidebook or are you using these kind of modern day apps get your guide and things like that that, that you have in your phone how, how do you get the information you need to make the most of your trips oh that's a really good question um uh, it is a lot of googling a lot a lot of asking in my group or even reading the posts in my group because literally you can go in my group and you can search at the top and you know like Seville, I've been planning my trip to Seville and Cadiz and Granada and the Alhambra and, and, and I've got everything from the group. So that um, when I get where, I, where I'm going, I always do like to do walking tours. I love a good walking tour. And um, and I always think that's a great way to kick off because then you can find places that you want to go back to that you can then spend more time. I like, I like a hop on, hop off bus. 
in some places, depending on where I am. Uh, and again, depending on where I'm going and sort of why I'm going there, I do like to sign up for local things like maybe local cookery class or a wine tasting or something like that. So I will um, I will make a point of sort of seeing what's available and I, and I follow people on social media and things where, you know, you can kind of see what's happening in local, in local cities or sign up yeah, for alerts. Yeah, the, these walking tours are great. And, and as I say, Love some them. of the events that we, we organize are with local walking tours. And yeah. many of them are free. And yeah. uh, it, it's just wonderful. And, and you not only do you get a, a nice bit of exercise, you get, you know, the cultural, the history of, of the place. And you also get to do it in, in the company of a few other people. So yeah. it's actually often a great way. You might be yeah. doing a walking tour in the morning and you might have a dinner date for later on that evening by somebody, you know, just you just got chatting to as part yeah. of the group. Yeah, yeah. I love them. I really love them. And cycling too, <clears throat> depending on where you are. Um, I've done some cycling, city cycling tours as well, but mainly walking tours. I love them. Absolutely love them. Yeah. I like okay. city breaks anyway. Sorry, you were just going to finish, and so it's and it's no, great. no, no, not at all. No, I agree. City breaks. I, yeah. I, it's a very different type of travel, really, isn't it? Uh, just going for maybe two, three, or four days in a, in a nice city, particularly in Europe, and you know some of the older cities are they're fascinating, and there's so much culture uh, yeah. to, to be to be explored. And uh, yeah, I I love them. I always try and do two or three a year if I can, just short breaks, but um, keep things interesting. Any questions, any other questions from anyone else? Feel free to unmute if anyone wants to say anything as well. You've all been very quiet. <laughs> I really like the idea of the uh, walking tours and, and then of taking local classes. But, you know, if you don't know the language, how do you find the, la the classes? Yeah, that's a really good point. And it depends, of course, where you're going. <laughs> I mean, I think quite often some of them will will tell you what the language is and a lot of them will will um include english i have mm -hmm. actually ended up though in a in a wine tasting once where there was an in port where there was no english spoken at all and i didn't realize and it was fun and you can kind of figure it out wine tasting is not quite the same as trying to learn something quite you know a bit more intense but um yeah you obviously have to ch check the language the languages excuse me um what the language is on offer yeah so I'm thinking I've been to Germany several times and I would think they wouldn't have wine tasting, they'd have beer tasting, right? Well, I guess it depends where you go. Actually, they have some beautiful wines in Germany. Yeah, um, uh, depending okay. where you go. Yeah. If you okay. go into the Rhine region, they have all their beautiful Alsace wines and um, and I'm sure you could do some great wine tasting there. And I think about in the United States, they don't have walking tours that I'm aware of, maybe in New York City they do, but most places in the United States wouldn't have those. See, I don't know. Um, I don't know because um, <clears throat> I have done some cities um, in America, but I've tended to do those sort of ads or add on to work and things. So I've done it sort of with colleagues and what have you. I haven't really searched that. But I mean, I, for example, I was in Australia recently and Sydney is a huge city and they were had the most fantastic walking tours. Um, really? So I'm sure, I bet you could find them in New York. I, I bet yeah. they could, yeah. My, my mom has done a, a handful in New York. She did like yeah. a tournament tour um, like that. and like a walking tour of Brooklyn. They did like a pizza tour that just like right. from pizza right. shop to pizza shop. Yeah, I'm sure, sure. they, yeah. Boston yeah. is another good place Boston, for walking. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. because nobody can figure out where the streets go, Rita. <laughs> oh, it's just so much history in a a, a closed yeah. area it's oh yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah I was driving there one day and I could find the I could see where I wanted to go I could see the place but even the policeman could not tell me how I could get there it was really <laughs> frustrating <laughs> but anyhow yeah Urban planning these days with one-way streets, it's, uh, yeah, you don't know what you're dealing with when you take your car yeah. into the city. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they want cars in cities anymore, certainly in Europe, and That's they're probably true. right from Very environment. True. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it was originally cow paths, so, you know, that's how they organize Boston streets. So, anyhow, fun. 
Yeah, yeah. Boston, um, Boston. I've heard great things about Boston. I've uh, a lot of a lot of Irish Americans recommend trips to Boston, so it's on my list. Um, a beautiful city by all accounts. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any anything else before we finish up? Okay. Um. Uh. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was really enlightening and oh, really thank inspiring. You.